now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. John Daner in the final episode of Frontier Gentlemen, going back to November 16th, 1958, the last show of the series that is kind of uh, something that you couldn't do in the earlier days when you did a highlight show. They actually did highlights and, and pulled clips from a lot of the previous shows as uh, J.B. Kendall begins his journey back to England and reflects on the stories he's written. Frontier Gentlemen, November 16th, 1958. It occurs to me that in this, my last report to the London Times, there are many incidents which I have omitted, things seen and heard during these several months of my journeys through the American West. Here then, some random notes. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. These notes are being written as I journey by train to New York. From there, I shall board a ship for England and home. I recall in the Montana Territory town of Helena, a tall gentleman in high hat, black broadcloth frock coat, a dirty shirt with a torn paper collar, and the most singularly unpressed pair of nankeen trousers. He stood outside a saloon with a small case of bottles set before him. About a dozen men and women were crowded around, and a small yellow dog slumbered at his feet. Yes, sir, yes, lady, it's here. Here in this little bottle, magic you ask? No, say I, not magic. Pollock's original Mameluke liniment, a sovereign remedy for man and beast. It is confidently recommended to the afflicted as an infallible remedy for the following diseases. To wit, burns, cramps, pains in the joints, sore throat, frosted feet, rheumatism, spinal complaints, lumbago, old sores, cuts, bruises, swellings, sprains, pains in the back or sides, Headache, cutaneous affections, ague cake, bites of insects or reptiles, salt room, mange, cracked mange. hands, tetter, dysentery, cholera morbus, and cholera. What about the heaves, mister? Oh, the heaves you are, sir. And in this bottle, the answer to your question, sir, Pollock syrup of sassafras, or cure. Nature's noblest remedy for heaves, consumption bronchitis, group or hives, colds, coughs, asthma, hoarseness, difficulty of breathing, purifying the blood, whooping cough, and a dozen ailments too horrible to mention. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it costs only 25 cents for one bottle, or as an added inducement for your health, ladies and gentlemen, Pollock's original Mameluke liniment and a bottle of Pollock's syrup of sassafras, both for the small sum of 40 cents. Think of the dollars and suffering you will save by this miraculous boom. I I remember the duel fought between two ladies, rivals for the dubious hand of a swaggering young Lothario named Court Thompson. The entire town turned out for the event. The duelists were Matty Silks and Katie Fulton. They were to fire at ten paces, and all was in readiness. Well, sir, if you ask me, my money's on Matty. Matty? Why, sure, everybody knows Matty Silks. You mean you ain't visited? No. 
I got ten dollars says she'll blow Katie Fulton's bustle clean out of the county. Aside from Court Thompson, Matty ain't standing for Katie's bar being on the same street. There's real bad feeling there. Well, which is Court Thompson? Feller standing next to Matty. Oh, he's a one, he is. Uh, you got to excuse me now, mister. I've been selected to count off the steps. All right, folks. Stay back. Let's get on this here duel of honor. Keep quiet. Matty, Katie, you know the rules. Ten paces and I count three and you start shooting. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ready, ladies? One, two, three. You killed me! I'm shot! It was Katie Fulton's shot that missed Matty Silks and hit Court Thompson. Some said she'd done it purposely, others argued that it was an accident. At any rate, Matty took the wounded Don Juan home, and as far as I know, their love burgeoned from that moment on. I shall continue these notes after the next stop, which is Chicago. <laughs> November 16th, 1958, Frontier Gentlemen on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Frontier Gentlemen was a delightful show that aired on CBS from February 2nd till November 16th of 1958. John Daner starring as J.B. Kendall, the writer for the London Times. But the show would end, as I said, this was the final show, November 16th, 1958. Daner would not be off the air in a starring role in a Western for long because one week later, November 23rd, 1958, Daner would star as Paladin in the radio rendition of Have Gun, Will Travel. November 16th, 1958, John Daner, Frontier Gentleman on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. <laughs> I remember an old man, a miner I met in Fort Benton. His name was Shorthorn Tom. On our journey to locate his lost mine, he gave me an insight into Western speech, which I have found to be most valuable. He was leading a balky mule along a winding trail, and the air was blue with invective. <coughs> oh, it ain't really cussing. Just sort of air in your lungs. Now, you take that mule. I call him a son of a gun. Now, that ain't rightly so, because anybody can see he ain't nothing but a son of a mule. <laughs> but he's a no good son of a gun, because that's the way it goes, see? Uh, yes, yes, I, I follow you. Now, speaking of that, what exactly is son of a gun stew? Son of a gun stew? Yes. Shucks, I'll tell you. <laughs> that's just about the best thing a man ever put in his insides. It's got brains and sweet breads. Oh, gotta be fresh killed cat. Gotta be. And tongue, liver, light, heart, kidney. Ho, ho, ho. I tell you, mister, that is a something. <laughs> That's better than poops any day. Yes, sir. When I find this claim, I'm going to get me a set of store-bought teeth. And I'll show you how to make a son of a gun stew. <laughs> you can throw everything in except the hair, horns, and holler. Ho, ho. That's a real grub. Yes, huh? Sounds and <laughs> tell me, what's hard tail? Oh, it's just a mule, like this ornery stump sucking son of a gun. A hard tail mule. Hear it? Stump sucker? Ah, ain't you never seen a horse getting his teeth against something and sucking wind? That's what a stump sucker is. Ah, oh, you don't want nothing to do with a critter like that. <clears throat> no sir. No. I've heard the expression "riding herd" on a woman. <laughs> That's courting, riding herds, courting. <laughs> Boy, you stick around, old shorthorn Tom. He'll have you talking smart as a bunkhouse rat. Gee, you know what we call a fella like you, green from the east? Tenderfoot. 
button, dude, prune picker, pilgrim, softcorn, greener. <laughs> what about you? Me? What? A rawhide, coffee cooler, pocket hunter, river sniper. Of course, fellas got me a lot of other things, too. <laughs> it don't really matter what they call you. It's what you are that counts. Now, I take you for a good partner, mister. Real good. Shorthorn Tom never did find his lost mine. He died up in the Highwood Mountains. I was with him. Then there was the performance of Othello that I witnessed in Kansas, the Frontier Theatrical Players. Othello was a fine, powerful fellow with a broad Texas accent, a cowhand recruited by the wife of a ranch owner. Needless to say, the wife played Desdemona. Unfortunately, Othello had a scant three days in which to memorize his part. The resultant scene I report verbatim. And that handkerchief which I give give to you, I give it to Cassio. No, by my life and soul, send for the man and ask him. No, I don't want no sweet talk, honey. You all take heed of perjury, cause you aren't on thy deathbed. I, but not yet to die. Yeah. So you confess freely about all that sinning. For for, for to deny For to deny each article with oath cannot remove or choke. Uh, something something that I do grunt. Honey, you all gonna die. Mercy. Amen. And have you mercy too. I never did offend you in my life. Never loved Cassio, but with such general warranty of heaven as I might now, love, I look, never give him token. I saw y- I saw, you know, the handkerchief, everything, I saw he, it. Uh, he found it, then. I never gave it him. Send for him hither, let well, he him... he confessed. What, my lord? Well, you know, he, uh, he been dealing off he of the bottom. He will not say so. He won't for a fact. Honest Iago stopped his mouth. Oh, my fear interprets. What is he, dead? Had all of his hair been lives. My great revenge had stomach for all of us. Alas, he is betrayed, and I undone. Out trumpet. Weep thou for him in my face. Oh, banish me, my lord, but not kill me. Now, Strump. Kill me tomorrow, let me live tonight. No, sir. But half an hour. Being done, there is no pause. But while I say one prayer... It's pray- too late. You take your hands on that food, son, and I'll come up there and rip the hide off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The player's conclusion had deviated somewhat from Shakespeare's intent, but I found it nonetheless dramatic. I've often wondered whether the Texas Othello continued his thespian career. He could have made a fortune in London. Uh, Speaking of fortunes reminds me of an extraordinary thing that happened in Montana Territory. I shall note it down after dinner. In motoring today, it's the lock by Studebaker. Coming your way, smart, sensible, spirited too. The perfect family car for you. The lock by Studebaker. See it today. Now at last, a U.S. car that's sized just right for the needs and tastes of the times. It's the Lark by Studebaker, your new dimension in motoring. The Lark gives you big car spaciousness on the inside, it's seat six, and small car convenience on the outside. It's nearly three feet shorter than conventional cars. Smartly styled, beautifully engineered, the Lark looks better and drives better than many expensive cars, yet costs less to buy far less to operate. It's your new dimension in motoring today. It's the Lark by Studebaker. See it today. The Lark. I mention an event in Montana Territory, but it happened to a Chinese gentleman named Li Chao. He was a well-educated man, scrupulously honest, and ran a general supply store in Helena. During the few days of my visit, I had enjoyed several cups of tea and one or two chess games with him. 
I remember that one afternoon he seemed quite excited. His hand shook as he poured the tea. This is a momentous day for me, my friend Kendall. Oh? You are the first to know. I am a mine owner. No. Look. A legal document which gives me possession of the lucky hand plus a claim. I have paid for it with my life's earnings. $40,000. You know that uh, some men have been bringing me their gold dust to keep for them, as in a bank? Yes, I remember you telling me. Uh, it was their claim that I bought. Uh, it took much time, much trade talk, but finally they agreed to sell. Now I am a mine owner. As soon as I have made my fortune, Kendall, I shall return to China and live the remainder of my life in peace and security. Li Chao was evidently the last or next to last man in Helena to find out what had happened. I heard it three days later from the barber who was shaving me. Hey, mister, it's the biggest joke in Helena since old man Hornaday strung up that mule for kicking his wife. You mean you ain't heard? No. Hey, a Chinese gent along the street, Lee Chow, bought himself a mine. Yes, I know. You know it's salted? Salted? He's paid 40000 for a salted mine. What the boy's done was to take him a bag of gold dust every day to hole for him. Lee figures they got a whopper claim. He wants to buy in partners. No, sir, says they. And then when Lee's prime real good... The boys figure is how they've done enough work, they're ready to sell out. Lee Chow buys for $40,000, the fellas take your dust, and vamoose leaving Lee Chow with a deed to a vegetable farm. That's all it's good for. Well, does he know yet? Uh, if he don't, he's the only man in hell they ain't. Well, what about the men who sold the claim to him? Well, last I heard, they was headed for California. Ah, uh, good morning, my friend Kendall. Good morning, Mr. Lee. You appear downcast. Is something the matter? Well, I've just heard some rather bad news. It's, it's about your claim. Oh? You've been cheated, Mr. Lee. There's no gold. The men who sold it to you knew it. So? But I, I do not understand. Yesterday, my boys who are working for me, they bring me a sack of dust. Here. See for yourself. It is the same as I have seen before. Your workers took this out of the claim? It is just as it has always been. I, I, I don't understand this talk of cheating. <laughs> Neither do I, Mr. Lee. Yeah, ah, here is my friend, Ji Ping. He very fine miner working for me. Good morning, Ji. Good morning, Lee. Good morning, honored sir. Good morning. My, uh, my friend here, Kendo, he is worried about the claim. He worried? Why? There is talk of uh, salting the mine. Then salt is of gold. Here, from work of yesterday. One ounce more than first day. Ah, uh, I do not know from where you hear this bad news, my friend Kendo. But if the rest of my life is as unfortunate, I shall indeed be a rich and happy man. Will you take a cup of tea with me? Perhaps a game of chess? A day or so later, I left Helena and didn't return for about three weeks. Then it was only to spend an hour or so arranging for transportation to Fort Benton. I went to the store of Mr. Lee Chow and found to my surprise that it was closed. I walked to the barber shop and over a hair trimming learned what had happened during my absence. Lee Chow, Mr. You whispered that name around these parts. Say, ain't I seen you before? Yes, I came in for a shave a few weeks ago. Yeah, never forget a face. Well, what about Lee Chow? Gone. China, they say. Well, what happened? It's all that claim of his. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, maybe you are, but there's a passel of fellas around here who ain't. You know what that son of a gun did? What? Salted his mind. So, ain't that what? something? Everybody figuring Lee Chow an honest man, and he salts a mind. Shows you. Well, how? I mean, I thought the claim had turned out to be good. What do you, what do you call it, a bonanza? Yeah, that's what everybody thought. You know what he was doing? Every day he had one of his coolies bring in a sack of dust, made sure people saw it. After a while, fellow gun figuring that Lee really had struck pay dirt. Couple of them went into Lee's place, showed him a sack of dust. He, he showed it to me. Sure he did. And he had one other sack. That's all he had. When he came kept in the store, the other he'd give back oh, the coolie and bring it in the next day. <laughs> uh, it ain't nothing to laugh at, mister. You know what he done? <laughs> no, I haven't any, any Sold idea. Sold that worthless bit of ground for a hundred thousand. <laughs> yes, sir, a hundred thousand, then skips off oh, to China. No. Biggest swindle ever seen in the territory. <laughs> Fellas who bought it found out the next day they ain't enough. 
I have thought of the outlaw, Dick Gillis, and the interview I had with him in Virginia City. He had been convicted of holding up a stage and the murder of two men. We talked in his cell, the marshal sitting outside at his desk, keeping a watchful eye on us. Gillis was quite proud to be the subject of an English newspaperman's report. Perhaps he colored his life for that reason. I'll never be quite sure. I'm 36. 36 years out of a mother's arms I never knew. She went up Salt River when I was born, Savvy. My pa, he were a wicked old so-and-so, used to beat the tire out of me. I run away from home when I was 10. Where did you go? Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado. I've been all over. I seen more than most men see in five lifetimes. Less than I wish I had. November 16th, 1958, Frontier Gentlemen on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We'll hear the conclusion coming up in just a few moments following these important messages from your favorite station. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now, the conclusion of Frontier Gentlemen, starring John Daner, November 16th, 1958. What made you start just being an outlaw? Man doesn't start, mister. Shucks, I was born outlaw. Did my first killing when I was 10. Shot me my pa's horse. That's how come I run away. Well, why did you shoot his horse? I don't know. Because I guess the old varmint cared more for horse flesh than for his own son, maybe. I sure hated that critter. If I hadn't killed the horse, I'd have killed the old man. Now, that's for sure. How many men have you killed? In fair fight, two. No matter telling it now, because I'm going to hang anyway. Seven. Seven I killed in hate, for killing's sake. Do you have a girl? I got a wife. Ain't seen her for three years now. There's a kid, too. But I never did go back. I guess is how they'll manage along. You know, a man like me oughtn't to take up with a wife and her kids. There's something all fired wrong. Wrong? Fella like me, I know I done bad. I know I'm going to hang. And there ain't no one going to sorrow. Kind of wish that weren't so. What do you think? I know what you mean. If I had me a 44, I'd shoot my way out of here and I'd head for the hills and live, you know? Funny how quick a man forgets the smell of grass and sage... I should have been one of them poet fellas. I, I knew Jack Crawford once. You ever meet up with him? No. I'd like to ask you a favor, mister. What is it? You write what I'm telling you in that English paper of yours. You say maybe somebody sorrowed when I got my neck broke, huh? Make it up maybe like my wife or kid heard and they sorrowed. I will. Day comes when... Man gets to be alone. Ain't nothing more to look at except what's inside. <laughs> I sure hadn't ought to kill that horse, you know? These are some of the things which I've seen, heard during my travels. I find myself despondent at the thought of leaving this country and its people, yet my sadness is tempered with the realization that perhaps someday I shall come back to the great American West, which for the past several months has been my home. About the little white tablets in the little green pocket row. Just a waiting for the moment when you need them to bring your acid indigestion under control. Tums are the little white tablets in the little green pocket row. Tums for the tummy. T U M S. Bring relief quicker than you'd ever guess. Best for any kind of acid distress. Keep them handy in the pocket row. Keep your tummy under Tums control. 
Tums are fast, effective, and safe. Tums relieve the discomfort of acid indigestion quickly with no danger of acid rebound, sometimes caused by harsh alkalizers. Always carry Tums, 10 cents. Three-roll pack, a quarter. New six-roll pack with free metal carrier, 49 cents. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Joseph Kearns, Vic Perrin, Jack Crucian, Jack Moyles, and Harry Bartell. Bud Sewell speaking. And with that, J.B. Kendall, the Frontier Gentleman, rode off into radio history. November 16th, 1958, The Frontier Gentleman on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, let's listen to the soap opera Claudius, sponsored by Coca-Cola. This originally broadcast November 16th, 1948. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the famous play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. If a body meets a body, need a body cry. Oh, how'd I ever get into this? What's the matter? You tired already? Mama! I didn't see you. Well, that was a heartbreaking groan you just laid out. That was no groan. That was my singing. My mistake. It sounded much like a groan. Now, Mama, why would I be groaning? I just thought you might be tired of painting the porch furniture. Would you like to do it? No, thank you very much. Because if you would, Mama, I'll, I'll lend you my paintbrush for a ah, while. Then you are tired. I am not. I am merely being sacrificial. I see. Well, why should I be tired? I merely painted two chairs. I must say they look pretty good, too, if I do say it myself. Hmm. And I painted the under part, too, Mama. So you have the glider and two chairs and three tables left to do. Oh, dear, is it that much? And when you paint it longer, it'll seem like even more. <sighs> it's fun, though. You, you ought to try it, Mama. Not a chance in the world. It's chilly out here on the porch, and David will be home soon. Not too soon for me. Oh, golly, I got some in my hair. It'll be too soon if you're still in blue jeans and sticky with white paint up to your elbow. Oh, David's not as fussy as you. Fortunately for you. You know, Mama, the furniture will look just like new when it's finished, won't it? If it's ever finished. Well, why shouldn't it be? You have an awful lot left to do when your arm's tired already. Mama, stop saying that. Haven't you ever heard of the power of suggestion? All right, then. Your arm isn't tired. It's just limp a little. <laughs> you're having a wonderful time making fun of me, aren't you, Mr. Superb. Brown? Superb. Well, then, in case you're interested, there is nothing as much fun as slopping around with a big paintbrush. And you're jealous. Have it your way. It's lovely paint, isn't it? Oh, I should have worn gloves. Well, too late now. Oh, back to work. Time is a fleeting. Times are fleeted. Spring's gone, and I don't think you realize it, Mrs. Norton. Mm, I realize it. Mm, in that case, most civilized people paint their porch furniture in the spring. So? The reason for that being that it is in the spring that porch furniture is taken out of the barn where it has spent the winter and is once again placed on the porch. So? So that it might be fresh and give the appearance of being new. Porch furniture is painted in the spring. Do I make myself clear? Yes, perfectly. But what's the difference whether it's painted in the spring or not? Claudia, think. It's just what I've been explaining to you. Oh, I think furniture should just be painted when it needs to be painted. No. Right now, it needs to be painted. So that's that. But Claudia, by spring... But nobody's going to use it all winter. Mama's going to be stored in the barn. And I assure you, the cow and the pig won't be the least bit interested in it. Have it, it your way. I am. And think, Mama, when spring comes, the porch furniture will be all ready for it. It'll come out like the daffodils. No fuss, all sparkling. You hope sparkling. Well, I don't see why it shouldn't be. All it's going to do is sit around between now and then. Oh, gee, I wish it were spring now. Because then the furniture will be all painted. Mm, spring's nice for other reasons, too. Last year I was having the baby. Wonder what I'll be doing this year. Taking the porch furniture out of the barn, all sparkling and painted. <laughs> so get back to work. I am working. A person can just go so fast. Be careful, Mama. Claudia. You're spattering paint all over. Oh, God. 
That's what I put the newspaper down for. Yes, but your aim's so good, you managed to hit the floor in spite of it. Mommy, you know, you're getting more like David every day. David's not a bad person to emulate. Well, the only trouble is you are emulating the part of him that says he does everything better than I. I could paint that chair better than you. Prove it. Just prove it. Well, now, you leave unnecessary brush marks. Where? Where? Show there. me. There. There, on the arm. There. Those aren't brush marks. What are they? Well, well, the paint's too thick. Oh, so they are brush marks. What have you got against a few little brush marks? Here, give me that brush. Aha! So you think you'll show me a thing or two, Mama? Mm, I might. Well, I used to be quite a good hand at painting myself. All right, go ahead. Out, out. Oh, oh, my gosh, my legs are stiff from me. Ouch! <laughs> I remember when we were first married, your father and I painted all our furniture. We thought we'd save money buying the unfinished kind, and we ended up with... Dozens of unused cans and enormous paint. <laughs> but I kept the furniture till oh, we had fun. A large dose of it. And it had to last you, didn't it, Mama? It did. Now see, Claudia, no brush marks. So you're really an expert, Mama. The trick is to go over the same spot twice, the second time more heavily than then. I'll to... tell you what, Mama. Listen, now, since you're so talented and since I'm all smudged up with paint. I'll, I'll do what you said. I'll go upstairs and I'll, I'll wash myself up with turpentine before David comes. But, Claudia, come back here. Yeah, you, you, you go right on painting, Mama. And if you're not finished before I come down, I'll help you. If you think for one moment Thanks that... Thanks a million, I... Mrs. Brown. Oh, heaven knows why I thank you for letting you do something you've been dying to do. Claudia. Goodbye, Mama. Have fun. I'll get even with you for this. Painting furniture Oh, never heard of such a thing. Claudia! 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 She just went upstairs, David. That's a great thing to do. Man comes home and his wife disappears. <laughs> just one little old mother-in-law left to greet you. I didn't hear your car pull in. Hello, uh, David. Pulled in all right with me aboard. Good heavens. Little old mother-in-law, what on earth are you doing? What does it look as if I'm doing? Painting. Well, that's what I am doing. My own mother-in-law, whom I've always respected whom I have looked to for advice and comfort, whom I have admired since I first set eyes on her daughter, her daughter, my own mother-in-law, and she's doing nothing but painting the porch furniture. And what is so terrible about painting the porch furniture? Well, it's not a crime, but who paints porch furniture in the fall? Nobody. I do. Is this one of Claudia's wild schemes? I don't see what's so wild about it, David. But, uh, Mrs. Brown, let me explain. Nobody paints porch furniture in the fall. Everybody paints it in the spring when it's about to be used again. That's sensible. Then it's nice and fresh and sparkling. Looks well, like a I think porch furniture has to be painted when it needs to be painted. Couldn't, um, couldn't it wait until spring? Why should it? Well, I don't suppose it has to wait until spring, but it seems a lot more sensible to me. It's going to get all dirty in the barn all winter. You know that, don't the you? The cow's not going to use it, is she? Ah, this sounds suspiciously like Claudia's idea. There, um... Fill up the nail holes there. Yeah. All right. Aren't you freezing out here on the porch? Well, it's a little windy, but painting's a very active business, and I'm warm. Oh. Of course, every now and then, the wind blows a leaf into the paint, but other than that, we're doing fine. Won't you paint it leaf-colored? <laughs> well, have it your own way. Did uh, Claudia help? Of course she did. Those two chairs. Did a rather good job at that. Oh, dear, I... I think I can get under this one without getting paint on my nose. Mm, I hope you don't mind my just standing around and watching. Of course not, David. Thank you. There is nothing that is such fun as squishing around in a bucket of paint. Really? Unless it's watching someone else squish around in a bucket of paint. Uh, careful of the brush marks right there, Mother. What yeah. brush marks? Right there. Is the paint too thick? Oh, it could be. Here, pour a little more turpentine in. Oh, that's a good idea. There you go. Ooh! Oh, my hand is getting stiff. It is pretty chilly out here. You, um, you forgot that little spot under the arm right there. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll there, get it feel. now. There, there. All right. How long is it going to take this paint to dry? Oh, it'll dry by tomorrow morning. Really? Then we'll get Fritz to store it away in the barn. Then when spring comes, it'll be so simple. Well, just as long as it doesn't get moldy. Um, uh, uh, you forgot the inside of that slat. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really think this brush is a little too large for this. You know, Claudia, the bigger the better. I used to love to paint when young. You make that sound as if it were a hundred years ago. 
When young, I often thought it would be nice and satisfactory to be a house painter. And Hitler came along, and I changed my mind about house painting. Hmm. I'll have to rest a moment. Hmm. I'll have to rest a moment. I guess I'm not in condition for this kind of activity. Uh, hand me the brush, Mother, and I'll help you out with a few strokes. Don't get your suit spotted, David. I won't. I happen to know how. How? Here, dip the brush. There. Now squeeze off the excess paint and a smooth, long stroke. I don't hmm? think this furniture will need two coats, do you? Why should it? It's practically new. There's a stick of wood to mix the paint with, David. Oh, right. It settles rather quickly. Now, no kibitzing from you, Mrs. Brown. I once painted the whole side of a house by myself when I was nine years old. Side of a house at nine? Mm-hmm. A chicken house. Well, David, since you're so talented and it's rather chilly out here on the porch, I think I'll go and wash up for dinner. Hey, wait a minute. I was just going to help you out with a few well, strokes. That's all right, David. I don't mind hey, you do it at home. Hey, now, Mama. Right ahead, if you like. Well, of all of... Hey, Mama. Mama. I'll tell Bertha to hold dinner so you have time to finish, and then wash up. Hey, Mother, now come back here. You can't go off and leave me holding the brush. A man comes home from a long day at the office, and the first thing you know, he's got... Hey, hey Mother! Shouting about... Shouting? Me. Who's shouting? It's funny. I thought I heard a man around here shouting like a banshee. Well, you must be hearing things. Yep, I was hearing things. Hello, darling. How you feeling? Uh, don't come too close. You'll get paint all over. Oh, oh well, I don't mind a little paint. Well, for heaven's sakes, darling, what are you doing sitting out here on the porch painting the furniture? Just as you said, I'm sitting out here on the porch painting the furniture. But what on earth are you doing that for, David? Because it needs painting. Well, yes, it does, obviously. But, darling, who ever heard of painting porch furniture in November? Well, who ever heard of not? Well, what I mean is that well, most people paint porch furniture in the spring just before it's going to be used again. Well, that's silly. That's just plain silly. Just because that's the way most people do it doesn't mean it's right. Oh, it doesn't. Well, of course not. Oh. Paint it now in the fall, and then when the spring comes, it's all ready for use. I see. No whips, nor hands, or butts about it. It's all ready. It's sparkling, and mm -hmm. it's painted. Well, there, there's some truth in what you say. I say that porch furniture should be painted when it needs painting. Well, I'm sorry, darling. I, I, I just can't agree with you, David. It, it just won't look the same as if you painted it now instead of in the spring. What? Well, I think it's perfectly ridiculous. I think you should have waited. I should have waited? I think you should have exercised some self-control and waited until April. After all, darling, if winter is here, can spring be far behind? Are you standing there telling me that I should have waited to paint this? I certainly am. I'm definitely telling well, you. Well, I... I'll be gall-danged. I'll just be gall-danged. Now, 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 David, darling. Now, this is no reason to get angry with me. I'm just giving you my personal opinion. I think it's foolish nonsense to paint furniture before storing it. But if you insist, it's up to you, dear. Mm, well, I'll be gall danged. Some programs you can get with half an ear as you dust and make beds and putter about the house. Others seem to deserve your whole attention. While you listen to either, it's pleasant to have a bottle of ice-cold Coke nearby. Or delicious, sparkling Coca-Cola... Helps you listen refreshed. Say, Joe, if you're not busy, you can do me a great favor. Well, I really haven't much time, David. Uh, what is this favor that you're interested in? Well, now, uh, just uh, what do you think it is? Uh, the porch furniture. <laughs> it's an awful lot of furniture to paint, and to tell you the truth, I'm getting hungry. That's all right, David. Claudia will give you a bone before you're finished. How I got stuck with this job of painting the furniture, I don't know. Don't you, David? Yeah, just one of those things. I certainly hope that Claudia appreciates it. Claudia appreciates it. She appreciates you, too, boy. Well, I don't know. When I get stuck with a job like this, I often wonder. Well, I guess I'd better get back to work. Well, David, don't be disheartened. Wait until tomorrow. Then you'll find out just how much Claudia appreciates you. Well, get back to that paintbrush. I'm getting... Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. 
and ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. This broadcast of Claudia was supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. Reminds me of the story of the millionaire who hired a blonde to, uh, uh, said, you know, I'll give you $25 to paint my porch. So he did, yeah. And went out and 25 minutes later, he came back, said, that ah, porch is done. Two coats even. Said, really, that fast? Says, yeah. By the way, it's not a porch, it's a Ferrari. Okay, uh, from uh, November uh, 20, November 16th, 1948, Claudia here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you for making us a part of your day. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allow us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station. Uh, if you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single show. You can find all of our shows on demand at my webpage, which is classicradio.stream. That's classicradio. Dot stream stream our shows learn about building a classic radio collection of your own you can find our social media links you can contact me and if you're so inclined you can buy me a coffee that buy me a coffee money helps us to expand this classic radio theater program that's at classic radio dot stream and visit my friend ted over at radiomemories.com he has restored a bunch of new programs and has improved his uh, whole thing there check it out he's got a whole new list he'll send you contact ted at radiomemories.com that's radiomemories.com thanks for tuning in and uh, please tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial classic radio theater with wyatt cox right here on your favorite radio station